Romans chapter number 6. We'll begin reading verse number 17. The Bible says, But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness. For when you were servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, the latter part of these, uh, this chapter, get okay, too much, we can't get into it. If we started at the beginning of the chapter, too much in this to cover everything that we read. But in verse number 17, what do we find? Thanks for what God delivered us from. He says, but God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin. Anybody know what were is? That's a past tense word. Right? Jesus said, I've come to give you life, life more abundantly. If the Son set you free, you're free indeed. What do you make you free from? Sin. You're no longer a servant. You're no longer a slave under the bondage of sin. Okay? Then he goes on. But you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine that was delivered unto you. Well, what was that doctrine? Well, they got about... Five, five and a half chapters in the book of Romans that he's already covered. We can go back and look at everything that the Apostle Paul preached in the book of Acts. That's the doctrine that he's referring to. The doctrine of the converted saint. Right? Last service said, I was here on Sunday, right? Bella got dunked in the water. Right? What did our pastor teach on that night? Right? That baptism, outward manifestation, what happened inwardly? Well, what happened inwardly? We were buried with Christ in death and raised in newness of life. He died out to the flesh to lay down his life and take it back up again to prove that he was God and to shed his blood as an atonement. We died out to sin. Right? He literally died, but we, being a new creature, died out to our old man. Right? Well, what was that old man? Well, verse number 19... I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of flesh. For as ye have yielded your members, servants, to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, then, verse number 20, for when ye were servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. Then he says, What fruit had ye in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? What did we die out to? Well, first, we died out to bondage. Hallelujah. Right. But when he made us that new creature, verse number 19, the infirmity of the flesh is that the flesh likes to sin. It's cursed. It didn't get saved. Infirmity means sickness, right? ailment, something that keeps it from being whole. But what's that in your flesh? Well, this flesh going back to the dust of the ground. Right, one of these days he's going to give me a new body, body fashion like his. Well, what's going to happen to this one? It's going back to the ground. Right, that's the infirmity in my foot. Well, because of that infirmity, before we were delivered, look at verse number 19, you've yielded your member servants to uncleanness. Your members, he's talking about your bodies. Right, we are members of the church. Why? Because the, the church is one body in Christ. He's saying you yielded, meaning you didn't resist. You allowed it to happen. You didn't put up a fight. In fact, if you yield to something, you're willing to allow it to happen. You know what that sign yield on the road means? It means let the other car go so it don't crash into you. Really, that's what it means. Yield, give way. Right? Permit somebody to go in front of you so that we don't have to call the ambulance every time two cars come to this intersection at the same time. Well, he said, ye yielded your members in the past 
to unrighteousness, to sin. He goes on to say, uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity. He's saying you didn't just have iniquity. Your iniquity begat more iniquity and more iniquity and more iniquity. He's saying it was a never-ending cycle. What does sin do? Sin keeps sinning. What does unrighteousness do? It begats more unrighteousness. What does iniquity cause? More iniquity. Right? Two wrongs don't make a right. So then, when we find down here, even so now, yield your member servants unto righteousness, unto holiness. For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. Now that's not saying that we were liberated from righteousness. It's meaning you were without righteousness. But any righteousness in us. So, verse number 20, What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? They say, go back and look at all that iniquity unto iniquity, all the unrighteousness, all that infirmity in your flesh. And what did it bring about? Well, it brought about death. That's it. He said, well, Brother Jordan, I've never killed anybody. No, but, verse number 21 again, for the end of those things is death. You reap what you sow. What does unrighteousness, what's the fruit of unrighteousness? Death. What's the fruit of sin? Death. What's the fruit of iniquity? Death. That's why we all die, because sin entered into the world. You say, well, it wasn't today. Well, no, but it kept you dead spiritually. Remember, we were free from righteousness. You know why we weren't righteous? Because we was dead in trespasses and sins. We were before, you know, we took our first breath in this world because we were conceived in iniquity, or conceived in sin, born in sin. Then we was sinners by trade. He said, really, what was the fruit? Everything that you touch, it died. Right? You say, oh, that fruit looks real nice, but you take a bite out of it, it's empty, it's death. You were laboring for whatever it was that you were laboring for. A whole bunch of different reasons people sin, but most of the time sinners sin because they're sinners. They don't know any better. But everything that they labor up, when they go to reap it, what is it? It's death. It's emptiness. There's nothing there. It can't satisfy it doesn't matter how much of sin you put in the ground doesn't matter how much you water it doesn't matter how long you give it to ripen when you take a bite of it the only fruit you're going to find is death that's the point he's trying to make. it doesn't matter how long it takes you to harvest it doesn't matter if your disappointment is immediate but all your labors come to an end there are you know great things that man's wrought in the world I mean go look at them pyramids over in Egypt but you know what? Those pyramids at one point, they was nice and smooth on the sides. They didn't have steps on them. The finishing stone, as they called it, was nice and smooth all the way down. Well, where are they at today? Well, at one point, it was nice and shiny and it was sturdy. But time, right? As it passes, their works, they're nothing. It's still there, but one day it's going to be gone. But we can go back and look at things. There have been bridges that have collapsed. You know, they said, oh, this thing's sturdy. We made it right. And what happened? Well, time, erosion, corrosion. And then one day a windstorm blew up that was just a little bit too strong, and then the bridge is gone. Or a little bit of water went under a roadway and, you know, started off as a little trickle, little by little, just kept washing that dirt out from underneath of it. One day the road on the side of the hill has gone. That's an example of what, doesn't matter how long you wait to harvest the fruit of sin, but be not to see if God is not my, whatsoever man so that shall he also reap. That's the promise. You have to reap what you sow. Doesn't matter how long you try to put it off, the day's coming where you got to, you know, eat crow. You've got to go out and say, well, I put it in the ground, now I've got to take it out. And let's be honest, most of the time it gets out of the ground without us doing anything, which is why we end up paying the consequences for it. We never addressed it, we just left it to fester. 
but he says that's what you used to be used to everything you touched it had no flavor it couldn't satisfy you'd go to draw water out of a well and there wouldn't be anything in the bottom of the bucket so it didn't bring up any water you could labor all day in the sun and then come back out the next day and just find destruction then really if you were to go and ask people why they're on so many medication for nerves and anxiety and depression and all these mental afflictions that we have you know what most of them would tell you they feel like no matter what they do it doesn't end up right you know what that's an effect of unrighteousness iniquity and sin those things can never satisfy but then we see the new creature that he made in verse number 20 for ye were the servants of sin free from righteousness then he talks about the fruit that we had the end of those things is death verse number 22 but now being made free from sin ye become or and become servants to God ye have your fruit unto holiness in the end everlasting life so here's the beauty about that new creature that he made us into that seed that he put inside of us we didn't plant it we didn't water it we weren't the ones that caused it to grow but yet at the end we get to reap the fruit but what's the fruit salvation right now we've just got the earnest of our faith that's what the Bible tells us you don't even know how good it is to be saved yet because you haven't experienced the whole thing until we get to heaven you ever think about that because the end fruit of salvation is that we are with him as he is that we'll be with him as he is for all of eternity to worship him for what he did for us right that's the end fruit you know what you got right now not that we've just got the it is tiniest bit of an inkling of what it's like to be saved truly to be saved is to be ransomed the ransoming isn't complete until the one that is ransomed is delivered unto the one that ransomed them what's keeping us from there? it's flesh but one day that's going to get out the way and I'll be with him forevermore because I'm in his hand, his hand's the father's hand no man can pluck me out of the father's hand right? we know that the end of the fruit of our salvation being made free is that we are free with him for all eternity that's the end goal but then there's the second meaning behind his statement all that we labor in in service of the Lord is to bring about everlasting life you know why God gave you a Bible so that you could know the will of God do the will of God and so that God could use you as a vessel to bring honor and glory to himself and to bring others unto Jesus you know why he left you here after you got saved so that you could bring others to Jesus the end fruit of those labors is everlasting life I've already got mine right but it's the everlasting life of others I'm not working for my fruit he's already given me my fruit the Bible says that I'm seated in heavenly places. My conversation's already recorded there. To be absent with the bodies, to be present with the Lord. What's that saying? The only thing keeping me from being in heaven is that God still wants me here. I've received. He held nothing back. Right? He said, I promise. And when we got saved, because he's God, he kept his promise you don't have anything spiritually that I don't have and I don't have anything spiritually that you don't have right? he gave unto every man equally he said whosoever may come well, guess that, that means he gave whosoever the same gift of Christ so our labor is not for what I get he says let's go back up verse number 19 halfway through for as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity even so now yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness he says our members now our bodies that we used to yield to iniquity and to sin and to unrighteousness to uncleanliness he says now yield or permit it to be so 
right? Your spirit strives for the will of God because your spirit's saved. You can never sin again. Right? In fact, God said that if somebody continues after they get saved to live a life of wickedness and unrepentance, that he may turn some over to the destruction of the flesh that the soul might be saved. Their very life grieved the soul that God, that new creature that he turned them into, grieved it so badly that God let their body die so that their soul could have peace. He's saying, yield yourself now, not unto works of eternal life. Because right? we can't work for eternal life. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should be able to, you know, lest any man should boast. If I was able to boast in what I did to get saved, I would have had a part in it. All I had to do was ask for it, and then he gave it. But we're not the fruit of our salvation is everlasting life, but we didn't do that work. That's what Christ did on Calvary. That's the fruit of his work. So what are we yielding our members to? Well, he says, yield your members servants unto righteousness, which before we had unrighteousness, uncleanliness. Right? We were free from righteousness. We knew nothing about it, didn't comprehend it. You know, said when Jesus, when he came, that the light shined into the dark, and the darkness comprehended it not. Unrighteousness can't wrap its head around righteousness. The polar opposites. Oil and vinegar cannot mix. You could swish them around together and get it real, you know, itty bitty and tiny to where you can't see that it's separated, that they're not the same. But it, after enough time, you know what happens? It separates out because it never mixed. It right? doesn't matter how hard you press, oil and vinegar, it's not going to become one thing. You can mash it, you can spin it, you can throw it in a blender. You can use one of them things called an emulsifier. All you're doing is delaying the amount of time before you see that there's righteousness and then there's pardon me, unrighteousness and righteousness. What are you saying, Brother George? Used to, we had no understanding of it. But now that we do, under, I'm robed in his righteousness. I do understand what it is to be right and to be wrong. Not according to what I say, but according to what thus saith the Lord. So yield your members. Again, allow it to be so. Permit it to happen. Your soul wants to be righteous because he's righteous. But the new creature wants to be like the one that created it. But what does the old creature want to be like? The world that it came from. Yielding does not always mean inaction. If yielding meant just l stop doing anything, but if you went and you saw a yield sign and you just stopped, you didn't move, guess what happens? The car's still moving. Yield does not mean to just do nothing. When you get to that yield sign, what you got to do? You got to put your foot on the brake. You have to make the conscious decision that I am going to do this and then do it. Right, well, what's it mean when it says yield your members under right? It's not going to be easy. It's not like we can just sit here and say, okay, Lord, I'm righteous now. Yield. I'm yielding. Right, you have to make the effort to do what you need to do. Now again, yield yourself unto righteousness. Did not the Lord promise to finish the work that he started in us? Did he not promise that we had been grafted into the vine, the true vine, which is himself? And that we being branches that are part of the vine, that he would grow in us? God wants to make us into the new creature to finish the vessel of honor that he intended us to be. You know what stops that from happening? We don't allow him. I don't have to make myself into what God wants to make me into. He promised he would do it. I don't have to become righteous because he's already righteous. He knows that in this sin-cursed flesh, I can't be sinless. 
Why do you think He wrote me in His righteousness so that the Father saw the Son when He looked at me? He doesn't see me and He doesn't see you. He sees Jesus. Right? He sees us as we will be. Because if God promises to do something, it's already done. It's impossible for Him to lie. And honestly, think about it. He's everywhere at once and throughout all time at once. Right? John... The revelator in the book of Revelation, he's already seen you in heaven. How'd that happen? Because God knew that it would be. And God took John and dropped him off a little bit into the future, said, hey, take a look and write everything down. Right? God is as much here as he is all of eternity. So he doesn't see me here, because he promised that if I accepted his son, that he'd give me life, life more abundantly, and make me that new creature, that he'd make me into the image of his son and because it's impossible for him to lie right John chapter 1 Jesus lamb slain before the foundation of the world same thing from the moment in alpha of time that it was decided that Christ would die for sin he was the lamb slain that's past tense before the foundation of the earth that it, in God's mind, it was already settled. So it's already settled that you're like His Son because He's already seen you there. He's there right now waiting on us in the future. But yet today, He's saying, yield your members. Allow what God put in you to continue to work. It takes effort. It may not be comfortable because really what's happening is when that branch is grafted into a vine that vine and the root of the vine and the center of it is growing into that branch and pushing from the inside out replacing what the branch used to be with something new for a long time on the outside it's going to look the same but one day that vine's going to break through that old branch and everything from the inside has been replaced with the vine not a comfortable experience you know what's going to happen your flesh is going to get pushed on it's going to crack it's going to get flung out the way by the spirit flesh isn't going to like that you know what we have to do we have to yield when it's hard yield when it hurts yield why because not my will but thine and then next he says yield your members on righteousness and holiness do you think that God he said it twice once should have been enough but Peter was just quoting when God said it the first time when he wrote it in his epistles but God said be ye holy for I am holy would God have said be ye holy if we were incapable of being holy that's not like a goal like some people think where it's like well I'm shooting for holiness but if I get close I think I'll be happy with it no, it's, it's not a scale. It is a state of being. You are either holy or you are not holy. Okay, you are either cold or you are hot. Most of you out there are probably freezing. I'm sweating up here. We're in the same room. It's not about where you are. It's not about how close you are to the vents. Right, it's not about what the temperature is outside. I'm get up here. It's, I'm going to sweat. Right? It is a state of being. And it doesn't matter what Miss Lisa does, how much iron she eats, right? It doesn't matter how many blankets she brings. It doesn't matter if she wore a parka in every Sunday. She's going to be freezing. You can mark it down. And Miss Veronica, too. It is just clockwork. Right? That's, that's who they are. Right? But we are either holy or not holy. It's not a... Well, I got pretty close to holy today. You know what anything less of holy is? Unholy. So would he have commanded? Right? It wasn't a law. It wasn't a list of the 600 laws that the Jews had delivered from God. But right? it wasn't in there. If you aren't holy today, go and make a sacrifice. No, holiness was the reason that the law was given. To show us that we were not holy. 
Go read the beginning part of this chapter. Right? Sin has no power without the law. But you know what kept us in bondage? The law. It wasn't sin. We were sinful, but the law showed us that we were in bondage. The law showed us that we had chains and fetters on us. Okay, but, he says, yield unto holiness. Again. The Bible says this arm of flesh will fail you. Any man that thinks that he, takes, that he stands, let him take heed lest he fall. Right? Lean not on your own understanding, but trust in the Lord with all thy might. Why are we reminded so many times that although we think we can, we're not the little engine that could? I can go out and do, but the question is, does God want me to do? What does He want me to do? When does He want me to do it? You know how to find that out? First, you've got to yield and spend time asking the Lord what the will of God is for your life. Because He promised that if we ask, He'd tell us. But then next, we have to ask the Lord, Lord, I know what I'm capable of, and it's not fulfilling the work, finishing the work that Christ did. Christ started it, and Christ is going to finish it. You know why somebody comes to receive salvation? Because the Holy Ghost has put them under conviction. You know that seed that he told us to go and spread? You know what that seed is? It's Christ. You know what the water is? Water into the Word. Well, you know what the Word is? Jesus was the Word made flesh. The Word is just a written testament of who Christ promised He would be in the Old Testament and how He came and fulfilled the promise in the New Testament plus everything that we need along the way to find out who He is, what He promised to do for us, how we can know without a doubt that He was the Son of God because He fulfilled so many prophecies that it is impossible that anybody else could do it in a million lifetimes, let alone 33 and a half years. This Word, the Word of God that He promised to preserve forever, He didn't promise to preserve it because some men were faithful enough to sit down and write it down. He preserves it because it's a testament of His only begotten Son. He was the Word made flesh, meaning He was everything that God had promised, everything that we needed, and when He went back to glory, He promised that the Comforter would come and fulfill better than if Christ stayed on earth what we needed, which was a companion. He promised that we've got everything that we need but all the work being done, it's not by us. We yield ourselves to be used as instruments, but we're not the one doing the work. So when he says, yield yourself unto holiness, I can live my life in a way that God can bring about holiness in my life. I can't bring the holiness. But He can use me. He can ordain me. He can sanctify me. For what end? His holiness. He is holy. It's impossible for him to not be holy. Right? But if holiness touches something, he expects it to be clean and for it to be holy. Because if it's not holy, he didn't want anything to do with it. We have to yield ourselves to allow him. But Tommy, did you save yourself? Did you forgive yourself of one sin that you committed? But no. We had nothing to do with our forgiveness, our purification, our cleansing under the holy blood of Jesus Christ. So why do we think we can make ourselves clean again after we sin when we get saved? Doesn't make any sense. Oh, I'm saved now. I know what, what I should be. I'm just going to try to be it. Right? Unfortunately, Yoda had it wrong. Right? Do or do not, there is no try. Okay? It doesn't matter how hard you try or how hard you don't try. The only way you're getting made into the holiness that God wants you to be is God has to make you into holiness. 
doesn't matter how hard you try or how much you know what you should be how hard you strive to become what you should be it ain't getting done without God's hand in it okay well most of that wasn't in our notes but as I was sitting home in a fevered state last weekend I was sitting and I was thinking mostly miserable but I guess it was around 5.30 on Saturday that the body aches started. I hate body aches. Right? I don't know what it is about them. I hate them. Don't like it. And I don't understand it. My skin is not sick, so why is my skin hurt? That, that, that doesn't make sense to me. Okay. In fact, it didn't make so much sense to me that one time I got sick and I did a whole bunch of studying on body aches. One, to occupy me because I was miserable. And two, to forget about how sick I was for a minute. You know what body aches are? Some people will tell you that. but we really don't know what it is. But here's what they do know. Okay, when you get sick, your body, we have this thing called an immune system that God made us with. And that immune system, when it senses that you're getting sick, it's got a couple of things that it can do. Right, it could send a whole bunch of white blood cells to it. That's to kill whatever it was that's infecting you. Yeah, that's why when people get cancer and they go through chemo, they're so susceptible to other illnesses because their white blood cell counts have been diminished by the chemotherapy. If they get any kind of sick, their body can't react to it. Okay, so there's that reaction. But then, how does white blood cells get throughout the body? Well, they're blood cells. So if you get sick, what's your body do? It sends blood to wherever you're sick. Why? Because more blood means more white blood cells, which means you get better sooner. Okay, well, sometimes you're getting sick. You're not quite there yet. Because body aches is one of the first symptoms that you have. And I don't know about you, but if I feel, if I get body aches, I know I got about two hours before I'm going to be absolutely miserable. But it is a precursor to sickness. But you know why they say that it happens? Because your body, knowing that it's sick, is sending out all this blood, it's inflammation. And what it's doing is, is it's putting a whole bunch of extra pressure on all the nerves in your body. Well, what does pressure on the nerve do? It causes pain. And you know what the thing about body aches that's the worst? Okay. At first, it feels like somebody like touched you with like a feather or something. And you're like, that feels weird. And then what happens? Pain all throughout wherever that was. And then the next thing you know, it feels like, oh, I just brushed up against something soft on my back, except you're laying down. And then what happens? Pain all throughout your entire back. Right? It is literally like an explosion moving outward of pain. At first, you're like, no, it's not that bad. And then all of a sudden, ow. And what happens, it just keeps bouncing around. No predicting it. No anticipating it. Don't know where it's going to hit next, but you know it's going to hurt. But for that brief instant, you're thinking, well, maybe this time is just, you know, because you don't even have to, if you brush up against something, that's when it really hurts. I don't know why. But really what it is, is it's your body being extra sensitive, looking for where is their sickness so that we can send the cure? And here's the thing. Nowadays, we don't have to worry because we're so antibiotic out of our minds that we each have our own individual variant of the coronavirus now. Right? Because there have been so many mutations. But we don't experience sickness as they experienced it back in the day. Used to, somebody gets sick. With something nowadays that's not a problem because we got this thing called penicillin and all these other things. But, but it may maim them for the rest of their life when they used to get sick. You say, well, how can somebody have a cold and then end up with, you know, a limp? It's because they had inflammation. If you put pressure on a nerve long enough, it'll start hurting the nerve. That's why I ended up having to have back surgery because I had a nerve that had a whole lot of pressure on it and nothing was taking the pressure off. 
because my brother needed a 9,000 pound desk moved up steps in his house we don't know that's what good. well I had the problem long before that that was the straw that broke the camel's back but what are you saying if a nerve has enough pressure on it it starts dying if you're sick and you don't have a cure that pressure is just going to keep increasing because the body's looking for where the sickness is it's spreading it out All right, so just for a few minutes I'm going to talk about the infection of sin does not the Bible say there's pleasure in sin for a season for that brief instant before a body ache hits what happens that ah, doesn't feel that bad in fact a few of them I don't know why felt like somebody was tickling me I hate being tickled one I'm not ticklish and two when somebody tries but tell me what happens when you tell somebody you're not ticklish they want to prove you wrong don't touch me get off of me <laughs> right that's mostly why I hate it but at first that's not that bad I've had it sometimes where it actually feels you're sitting there you're dying of a fever well not dying but you think you're dying of a fever because the Advil hadn't kicked in yet and as you're laying there all of a sudden a body ache will hit. but for a brief moment it feels almost like relief because it's almost like somebody touched it with an ice cube and you're like oh man it's finally getting cool in here no pain what do you say there's a deception in a body well there's a deception in sin pleasure and sin for a season but when it comes to the nature of the new man you know what sin causes in your spiritual life inflammation because again look with me in verse number 19 I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh sickness what's the sickness of your flesh sin what is the infirmity of the Christian, the saved one, the redeemed one? The infirmity is that we let sin back into our life. We didn't yield to what He wanted us to be, and instead we inserted something different. But at first, you may think that it's a relief, that you've just brushed up against something. You may think that, oh, well, that's just an inconvenience, like somebody trying to tickle me. Ah, that's... Just leave me alone. It's not that big a deal. I'll get over it. But what happens? There's a spiritual reaction. And you know what happens? God sends out a whole bunch of things to let you know you're getting sick. It causes body aches. Spiritually, you know what a body ache causes? Spiritual death. Because a man cannot serve two masters, to love one and hate the other. We're either growing spiritually or dying spiritually. There is no neutral. Right, there's only two ways on this way called straight, forward and backward. There is no let's stop and set up camp for a while. I'm happy at where I'm at. Doesn't cut it. He said, take up your cross and follow me. No, there's no time period there. You know what follow means? You follow. That's perpetual movement. Perpetual growth spiritually. Well, when it comes to sin being introduced, what's that? Inflammation. That's a conviction of God. You're trying to convince yourself that whatever is a part of you that God's telling you doesn't need to be a part of you, isn't that bad. And you know what God reveals? It's pretty bad. I don't know if it's because of that space of grace that the Bible talks about. I don't know if it's about God winking at our ignorance. But for whatever reason, when sin enters in, God doesn't make us start back at scratch. Because you know what sin does? The wages of sin is death. The fruit of sin and iniquity and uncleanliness, that's, that's death. Right? It causes death spiritually, but what it should do Thankfully, He sealed us until the day of redemption. Right? Our soul cannot sin anymore. But sin should 
reset the whole process. Should make us start back at square one. Yet somehow in His righteousness and His holiness and His omnipotence, He can keep us saved. But I don't have to worry about keeping myself saved. That's God's job. He promised that He would, and I believe that He can. But you know what that inflammation is letting you know? Something just entered in. Right? That convicting power of God. Whatever it is that just happened, it's bad for you. Most of the time when you get sick, you don't know what the sickness was. You don't know where you got it. All that stuff afterwards. That's looking at symptoms. That's looking at where you were, who else was sick. Right? The doctor saying, well, according to these symptoms, it could be 18 one of these things, but we're going to call it COVID. Right? You have heartburn, that's a symptom of COVID. You have COVID. But that's all after the man. You know what body aches is a sign of? You're getting sick. It's too late. Already been introduced. You can't stop it now. But body aches, if we're honest, not that bad. You know what's bad? What comes after body aches? Right? Depending on whatever. It's so many different sicknesses, all one thing in common. What is it? Body aches. It's your body letting you know bad things is about to happen. Right? This pain right now is because there's something in us that shouldn't be in us. But what's conviction? God convincing you that there's something in you that doesn't need to be in you. God's conviction is that space of grace where He sends those red flags out, those body aches, saying if we get this made right now, we can avoid a whole lot more. You know the people that get the sickest are the ones that when they get their body aches, like Brother Ray, okay, what do they say? I'll be all right. I got cut. It'll be okay. It's got gangrene. He's looking at it. Nah, it's nothing that turpentine can't fix. Yeah, diesel fuel. I, I, I'll go to the doctor if it gets worse. Well, you know what you're doing the whole time that you're waiting for it to get worse? Nothing. You're letting the infection run its course. You know what happens when you get body aches if you run before you start, you know, collapsing and pain and everything else because, you know, I thought I had food poisoning at first. And you know what told me it wasn't food poisoning? Body aches. You don't get body aches with food poisoning. You know what I did? I ran and got medicine right quick. And I ran out of it and Sydney had to go get me more. I asked for Dayquil and I got Alka-Seltzer. She said they were out of it. I believe her. But what do we introduce? We introduce things to counteract whatever it is. Well, in our case, we don't have to guess at what it is. Right? Spiritually, there's only one thing that's going to cause you an infection. It's sin. Right? And thankfully, it doesn't matter what brand of sin, doesn't matter what stripe of sin, doesn't matter what color you want to label it. Under God's eyes, it's sin. And He's got one cure for all sin. Let's get it under the blood. But body aches, they're the precursor. That pleasure of sin for a season. You ever... This, this is exactly what happened to me. I was standing in line at the pharmacy trying to get a different prescription when I felt the first body ache. And you know what I told myself, Brother Tommy? First one I felt, I thought... Nah, I just, I just imagine that. I, I, must, I must have been sitting funny in the car on the way here. That was just, that was just a kink in my back that it worked out. Nope. Second one hit, and I'm thinking, did I, like, bump up against something on the way? And, like, I am trying to rationalize that I'm not getting sick. I had the argument with myself, and I'm thinking, ah, it's probably just a sinus infection. My ear's been hurting the past two days. But I don't know why my ear was hurting. That's still hurting. Like every now and then, I'll just turn my head and my ear hurts. Like the inside of my ear. He said, what are you doing, Brother George? I don't know, but that had nothing to do with the body aches, but I told myself that it did. I thought the two were related. You know what happened? I left the pharmacy without any medicine other than the one that I came to pick up. You know what happened if I'd have bought everything that I needed then? 
I looked over on the shelf and I, I saw Dayquil. That's why I asked for it. They had whole shelves of it. What happened? Sydney went somewhere else. Now because I got the job done, though. But what are you saying? If I'd have listened to what my body was telling me in the first thing, I'd have had everything that I wanted. You know what happened afterwards? I had to deal with it on my own terms because of what I had decided previously. And I had to sit there and be miserable for a couple hours before I convinced myself, you know what? This might be something pretty serious. And you know, by the time I started feeling nauseous, if I'd have taken that medicine three hours before, it might have helped. But if I feel nauseous, the medicine ain't going to kick in in time before nauseous runs its course. But we say, if we listen to what the Holy Spirit's telling us, we can circumvent a whole lot of that death and that pain and destruction. It's still going to hurt. I'm still going to have to humble myself. Still going to have to admit to God that I failed Him, that I disappointed Him, and ask Him to forgive me. But that's a whole lot better than dealing with all the consequences and having to go through it. Because the remedy hasn't changed from the day that we initially got saved. We confess He's faithful to forgive and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know what that means? He gets us back to where we're in His righteousness. And if we yield, we can even be holy in Him. But you know what will stop that? The infection of sin. Body aches will turn to a fever. A fever, you'll get so exhausted, you lay down and go to bed. Well, if you don't take medicine, you're going to wake up a whole lot worse. You know what the friend of sin is? Time. Because the more time it has, the more death it causes. You know what the good thing about inflammation is? It'll get the infection out eventually. God will straighten you out eventually. If you're without chastisement, you're a bastard, not a son. If you're one of his, he's going to get the sin out of you one way or the other. All it takes is how long it takes him to convince us that we're wrong. Because we're stubborn and we don't want to yield. He'll get it out. But the longer we fight it, and the more inflammation there is, do you know that there can actually be nerve damage? That's why those people would be, you know, hunched over and they'd walk with limps for the rest of their life because the inflammation put so much pressure on them nerves that they couldn't use them anymore. But the infection of sin, even though you're saved and on your way to heaven, it could cripple you spiritually for the rest of your life. But the best news about the infection of sin is He's got the remedy. Still just as potent. Still cures just as well. And he's got that balm of Gilead that even though we deserve those scars and we deserve to be maimed for the rest of our Christianity as an example of what happens when you go out and you sin because he loves you, he promised that he'd restore you. But the longer you try to deal with it on its own, the more destruction it's going to cause. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.